All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Eric and I'm an AmeriCorps member with the Chagrin River Watershed Partners. We're joined this evening by Jared Bartley from the Cuyahoga Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, thank you all for joining us for this residential stream maintenance workshop. Um, it is brought to you by an Ohio EPA Section 319 grant. In this workshop, we will teach you about stream science and management, the legal aspects of stream ownership, and how to install and maintain live stakes for stream bank stability and habitat enhancement on your property. Um, for those of you who responded to the live stake poll when you signed up for this, we're expecting the live stakes to arrive in mid-December, so we'll be reaching out to you then with information about where and how to collect those. We'll likely have some left over, so if you would like to um, like to get that information, just reach out to me and or Kevin, and um, we'll make sure you get that information. Um, this presentation is being recorded, um, and as a result, all the attendees are on mute. However, if you'd like to ask questions, you can use the question box, which you should see on the side of your screen over there, um, to ask questions throughout the presentation, and I'll relay those to Jared. Um, and with that, I think I'll turn it over to Jared. All right, thanks, Eric. Um, and also, I apologize if you hear like a low hum or rumble uh, during the presentation. My fan on my laptop sometimes kicks on and it get, can get a little loud. Uh, so uh, hear that, that's what that is, and I apologize in advance if that does happen. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Like Eric said, my name's Jared Bartley. Um, I'm with Cuyahoga Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, let's see here. Um, as Eric mentioned, this program was uh, financed through a 319 grant through Ohio EPA and the United States Environmental Protection Agency. You can read the uh, text there, but basically um, what we say is not necessarily their position or their um, endorsement necessarily of anything that we're talking about. All right, a little bit about Cuyahoga Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, we were founded in 1949. We have a staff of 14. Um, you see our office there located in uh, the Asia Town neighborhood of Cleveland near CSU. Um, and our mission is pretty simple, um, basically to get conservation on the ground in Cuyahoga County. Um, so a little bit about tonight's presentation here, the things that we're going to be talking about. We'll talk about stream science in general, um, as a stream owner, what your, some of your rights, responsibilities are, and then some common stream problems and uh, solutions for those problems. So before we get any further, we do have a few polls we're going to do tonight. So um, we have two we're gonna do right now, just to get a feel for who's here and what our mix is of people. So um, the first one I'm going to launch right now is do you have a stream on your property? So you can choose yes, no or no but a friend or family member does so we'll give uh i can see how many people voted so we'll leave this open for a, a few seconds here maybe 10 15 20 seconds so we can get all those votes in um and see just kind of the distribution of people we have in the audience tonight as long as let's keep coming in i'll keep it open <laughs> all right so hold it open for about uh, five seconds more here. All right, now go ahead and close it. And I'm going to share the results for everyone here. So uh, we had 67% of people say, yes, they have a stream on your property. 15% say no, and eight, another 18% say no, but a friend or family member does. So that's pretty typical for these workshops. Um, some people who are very interested in streams and don't have a stream on their property, but uh, still would like to know more, and that's great. Um, but typically, um, we really are uh, catering this towards people who own a stream or have own property with a stream on it. I kind of go ahead and hide that. Our second poll for this evening, um, we'll have a few more later in the presentation, but. Um, what stream related issues have you experienced? So we have stream bank erosion and you can check all that apply um, on this one, but stream bank erosion, 
debris jams and blockages, flooding, other, or none. Um, and if you have, uh, if you answer other, um, if you just want to put that uh, in the chat or the question here, uh, what that other might be, um, and we can make sure we try to at least uh, touch on that or potentially could follow up with you later. So um, votes are coming in. We're at about 50 percent. We'll leave it open for another five, ten seconds here um, and we'll share our results. We have one question in the chat right now. Yeah. Would a river count? Would this apply to people who have a river in their back? Yeah, so when I say stream, um, I'm using that as a generic term to mean river, creek, run, stream, whatever you uh, want to call the moving water, channel, channel of moving from flowing water um, across the landscape. So. I use stream as a generic term because then that, that encompasses rivers, creeks, et cetera. All right, so we're up. We're going to go ahead and close this poll and share those results. So um, the vast majority, 73%, have experienced stream bank erosion, 41% um, debris jams and blockages, 46% flooding, and 12% other. So if you had one of those other, um, go ahead and uh, if you put that in the chat, we'll address the as a question. We'll address that later. And then the lucky 10% who have none, those are probably one the ones who answered they did not have a stream on their property. So uh, hide those results. All right. So moving along. So we're going to talk about some stream science here to get everyone uh, on the same page. So streams have four main functions in the landscape. Uh, some of them are obvious. They transport water across the landscape. Uh, they transport sediment and debris. So things like wood, leaves, whatever other uh, non-natural debris might end up in the stream as well. They provide habitat for fish, uh, mammals, birds, aquatic insects, all sorts of species. And then nutrient cycling, carbon cycling, nitrogen, phosphorus, things like that. Um, they provide uh, kind of more of this biogeochemical um, reactions, uh, places for that to take place. Um, we'll talk about some of the terminology when we're talking about streams, so different parts of a stream channel. So we say the ripple, we mean the shallow part of the stream. Sometimes people would think of, if they think of a rapids or something like that, um, a ripple, but it's not always that severe or that turbulent. Um, it usually has the larger uh, substrate, we say substrate, we mean the particles on the bottom of the stream and the stream flow is more turbulent. The water's flowing faster there. It's shallower, faster flowing. A pool is just what it sounds like. It's the deep, slower moving portion of the water. And these terms are all relative. In smaller streams, the pool, even though um, it's the deep area, might only be six, eight inches deep um, in a smaller headwater stream. Whereas um, in larger streams, it's, you know, order tens of feet deep in some places, just depending on the, the circumstances. So um, it's usually a uh, finer substrate because as the water slows down, it can't carry those larger particles. The energy of the water is not enough to carry those larger particles. So the substrate in the pools, sometimes you have some boulders falling and things like that, but it's largely gonna be sand and silt. And again, this depends on the geology of the area, um, what kind of bedrock you have uh, locally and upstream. Um, a bar, so we think of a bar in a stream, not the uh, bar we're going to have a drink necessarily, but um, we think of a point bar. Um, it's an area um, you can see in this image, uh, the kind of sand and gravel there. Um, usually on the inside of a bend in the stream. Um, Basically, uh, in, a, if it, in a healthy stream or unimpacted stream, the top of the point bar, so the highest elevation part, that'll flow right up into the floodplain next to the stream. There won't be uh, like a drop or something. Uh, we don't see that too often, at least in Cuyahoga County. Um, usually there's a, there's a disconnect there, um, and we'll talk about that, what causes that and the issues brought about by that. 
Um, but anyway, this would be a, a point bar would be a way to describe this. Um, if it's a, kind of almost an island in the middle of the stream channel, we'd call that a mid-channel bar, and that's a sign of lower stability in the stream channel. Uh, floodplain, I, you heard me mention this earlier. It's what it sounds like. It's the area next to the, the, to the stream, generally flat-ish, um, that will hold flood water, uh, excess water uh, during large rain events. Um, they really are important pieces, and uh, people often don't realize this till later, till they've either built on them or filled them in or things like that, but they really do play an important role. They're important parts of the stream system uh, for both storing that excess water, but um, actually helps dissipate energy, so it reduces erosion, um, stores sediment, uh, filters nutrients, great habitat. So um, when we dis the stream becomes disconnected or erodes down, um, so it's not really having that connection with the stream channel, you have a lot of negative impacts then, uh, especially downstream. Oh, one more note on the floodplain. People think floodplain and they think of, you know, the FEMA floodplain or what it's, it's mapped into the floodplain. Those are what we call regulatory floodplains. Those are basically for insurance purposes. It's a risk model. Um, when we're talking about floodplains here with the stream channel, we're really talking about geomorphic floodplain. So basically like the actual geomorphic feature. So it might not be mapped as a floodplain on the FEMA map, um, but it still provides that function. So healthy streams have riffles, pools. Um, they're connected to their floodplains. Um, and unhealthy streams, a lot of times we'll see it's more of a homogenous or the, the riffles are really short. The pools aren't very deep and they're really long. It's kind of just glides along. Uh, those tend to be less healthy systems. This all, of course, depends on a lot of factors like the slope, the drainage area, things like that. But in Northeast Ohio, uh, our streams tend to want to meander around, which means they have curves in them and have these defined riffles, pools, and floodplain connections. So this is kind of a busy slide, but um, there are lots of factors that contribute to a stream's ch its channel size, its shape, and how stable it is. Um, so basically how big of a drainage area it has. Um, the larger the drainage area, generally speaking, you'd have a larger stream channel because it's collecting more water and funneling it into. That's the whole idea of a watershed. Um, the land cover. Um, so if you have a lot of uh, natural land cover, forests, prairies, things like that, um, a lot of that rainwater will be absorbed. Whereas if you have more developed areas, uh, a lot of hard surfaces, parking lots, things like that, a lot of that water will run off. We'll talk a little bit more about that. The slope impacts the stream channel. Generally speaking, uh, the steeper the slope, the less kind of bendy it'll be. It'll be a straighter stream channel. Whereas the lower the slope, um, you'll have a lot more of the meandering uh, or curving around. Um, basically the type of sediment or debris in the stream channel can affect the roughness. So how rough the substrate is, the channel beds are, and that can be, like I said, from uh, boulders, that can be from woody debris, it could be from just, you know, if it's a sand or shale, that's a different kind of rough or less rough. Um, and roughness helps slow down the stream flow, which can uh, have positive impacts for preventing erosion. Um, and then other physical constraints, like if uh, a lot we found, we find a lot in developed areas, urbanized areas, that the streams have eroded down um, to the point where they're on the bedrock. And the bedrock then tends to not be that rough. And so the water really uh, kind of flows through there quickly and also causes then, it's harder to cut down once it gets to the bedrock. And so you have a lot more of the lateral erosion there, or side to side, so the stream bank erosion, so the stream bed. Um, if you're up against a valley wall, it's some, some stream channels have a very obvious valley that they're cutting through, others do not. Um, trees, tree roots, we are very, um, uh, very much promote and want people to plant trees and maintain trees next to stream. Those, tr those tree roots uh, really help to hold the stream banks in. Um, another um, uh, shrubs, pretty much any woody, any, any vegetation is great next to the stream, but the woody vegetation roots tend to be stronger. Um, and then, of course, man-made constraints like bridges, culverts, dams, or hitting walls definitely 
impact how a stream flows through um, the watershed. So um, I mentioned this briefly, but urbanization in streams, basically the natural landscapes absorb more of the rainwater where developed lands uh, have a lot more of that water run off. Here's a slide that illustrates that. Again, don't pay too much attention to all the text on this slide, but basically the size of the blue arrows indicate the amount of flow basically coming through those sections. You can see um, that more water faster. Um, my mother's a retired English teacher and she would probably not like my use, how I use that there, but basically you get more water than you had pre-development running off the landscape and running off the landscape faster. So one illustration I like to use for this is if you go for a walk in the woods in the summer, um, it starts to rain, um, you really don't get wet, not right away. Um, the tree canopy intercepts that rainfall. At least at first it rains harder and longer and that rainfall works its way down through the different layers of the forest, down the forest floor, um, where it's absorbed, slowly infiltrates um, into the ground. Um, it really rains, you get that runoff and it gets to the nearest stream channel. The stream channel slowly rises, maybe spreads out into this floodplain, slowly recedes. Um, by contrast, if you're in the parking lot, at Giant Eagle or Home Depot or someplace and it starts to rain, you're getting soaked uh, from above, you're sloshing through it ankle deep. Um, all that water um, has to go somewhere. It's not getting absorbed into the ground. It's going to the nearest storm drain, which, um, you know, if it's a newer development, it's at least going to a, a basin or retention pond um, to be held back uh, somewhat. Um, but anything older, you know, we have a lot of what we call legacy impervious surfaces. So these, uh, older developments, older parking lots, buildings, all that water is just going straight into the nearest to the storm sewer, which is just taking it straight out to the nearest stream channel. And all that extra water is getting in that stream channel faster, you get higher velocities, and that leads to erosion, things like flooding, things like that. Uh, the other thing that we've had to deal with is uh, changing precip precipitation patterns um, lately. Um, if you think it's just in your head, it's not. Um, there's been a few different studies, but um, I'm familiar, I've done a lot of work in the Rocky River watershed, um, and there we have a United States Geological Survey's maintained a stream gauge there um, since October of 1923. Um, I keep forgetting to update the slide, it's not 93 records of now, but years of record now, but basically in the 98 years of record, six of the 13 largest peak discharges have occurred since 2004. So in the last 15, 16 years, basically, um, we've seen six of the largest peak discharges, and we had a really big run there where um, 2011, 2012, 2013, and 2014 is actually the uh, second highest recorded discharge ever on the river um, with this gauge. Um, and I believe we've had one since I made this slide. I keep thinking and remember, and I forget, and I have to update this slide. But basically, what it amounts to is we are having more rain. Um, stronger rainstorms, more intense rainstorms, um, and that combined with our impervious surfaces and all that extra runoff has led to additional issues in, uh, uh, with our stream channels and their stability. So just an idea, this is the channel evolution model, but um, just here on the, the left, um, to see how the streams naturally evolve, but um, in these urban systems, what, so, what once took centuries to happen now it's happening over the span of decades or less, one to 10 to 20 years. Um, but you can see here um, in the picture, I've marked the line showing the floodplain elevation. And then you can see where the stream channel is. Um, so that's how much, and you can see um, my coworker, Elizabeth, uh, in the right side of the picture there for scale. She's about five, a little over five feet tall. Um, so um, to give you an idea of the degree um, of channel, what we call incision. So the channel has incised if it's eroded down. And so now that's that much more water um, that has to get into the stream channel. Instead of, instead of being dis dissipated and dispersed on the floodplain, that water now that would be dispersed on a floodplain um, to store that water and dissipate that energy is now concentrated in the stream channel. Um, and so you get extra energy um, moving water equals energy. So all the extra energy working on the stream channel and it's kind of a vicious cycle or a positive feedback loop where 
the more you erode, the more water you contain in the stream channel, and then the more uh, erosion you get. So um, we're going to move on to the legal uh, section, rights and responsibilities of uh, streamside or riparian property owners. Um, I just want to mention moving on this section, I am not a lawyer and none of this should be construed as legal advice. Um, this is just our understanding of um, Ohio drainage law and Ohio water law as it applies to stream ownership. So I uh, will start with a couple, uh, another poll here. So I'm going to launch this one. So if a stream flo flows through your property, do you own the water? So we're going to let this one go. And your choices are basically yes, no, or it depends. So uh, we're going to give people a chance to answer this. While we're waiting for that, we had a question regarding the large rainfall we've had in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Is the higher precipitation more just Ohio, or is it the Midwest or across the nation? Uh, it's definitely localized, so but it's definitely um, Ohio, so kind of upper Midwest. It, it, I don't want to say this wrong, but like I obviously I pay attention mostly to the Northeast Ohio and Ohio, but um, it's also parts of other parts of the upper Midwest and the Northeast as well, and possibly the parts of the Southeast. It's really kind of spotty. It's not everywhere. Um, you know, uh, it's been in the news a lot. A lot of the wildfires and droughts out west. Um, obviously, they are having less. Uh, rain than normal so um and i think the other thing is you know we're not getting necessarily a lot more the precipitation like our total amount of precipitation precipitation we're getting um has increased some maybe or stayed about the same but we're getting it in less more intense events so um it's coming more all at once or in, in fewer large um storms so I'm going to go ahead and close the poll here. Um, we're up to 84% have voted and share those results. So 5% say yes, 79% say no, and 16% say it depends. So survey says no. So um, the water is considered a um, part of the commons, basically. So it's in common ownership um, uh, for everyone in the state of Ohio. So you do not own the water. Before I talk about that more though, I'll go on to, uh, can you use the water? Well, actually, I will say um, one thing to keep in mind though, you don't own the water, but if the stream is on your completely on your property or that part of the stream channel, you do own the land under the stream. So um, one illustration or thought experiment is um, people can float through that river. Like they can float on there as long as they're um, on the water and they wouldn't technically, I think, be trespassing. Um, usually this is not an issue. Most of our streams on people's property are not large enough to float through on a canoe or something like that. But as soon as their canoe hits the ground, hits a rock, or they step their foot out of that canoe and step on the ground under the stream, on the stream bed, they would be on your property and um, trespassing as it were. Um, again, this is not something that occurs a lot, but um, that's kind of how it would work. Um, next poll question. If a stream flows through your property, can you use the water? So we'll get that one out there right now. So our choices again are yes, no, and it depends. People a chance to vote here. All right, we're getting close. We're up to about 70% voted. We'll keep it open for another uh, seven or eight seconds here. Let's see where we end up. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close this and share it. So our results, 72% say yes, 8% say no. 21% say it depends. So go ahead and survey says yes, you can use the water. So there could be some limits. So um, uh, 
if you're in the, it, it depends, uh, you, you know, it can maybe give you partial credit for that one. Um, you do have access, if you have the stream on your property, you can pump water out of it and use it to water your pond. You can divert the water. Um, the Basically, the, the standard for this is you can't do anything that would cause unreasonable harm to an upstream or downstream neighbor. Now, that's the key is unreasonable. It doesn't mean you can't cause harm. It can't, means you can't cause unreasonable harm. And there's no standard for necessarily for what makes it unreasonable harm. Um, and that's why basically these disputes, um, if there's not some uh, local regulation in place, um, the city ordinance or something that overrides it, and usually there's not, um, most of these disputes would have to be settled um, in court on an individual basis. Um, unfortunately. And our Ohio water law dates back like the, the, the drainage law, the, the, the precepts that these are, the principles that these are based on date back to like English common law from, you know, centuries ago. <laughs> so it's, uh, we're working with old concepts of public trust and things like that, that are determining how, you know, these are implemented. Um, so moving along, um, going to, um, our last poll question here for the evening. If you have a stream on your property, if stream flows to your property, who is responsible for maintenance? So you, um, a local government entity, such as a city, county, um, other special district, um, all of the above or none of the above. So you're right, people, a chance, everyone a chance to vote here. Um, so this is just kind of give, again, kind of setting the stage for then when we get into maintenance and stream repair, um, you know, who you should be looking at uh, up to do that. Uh, leave the poll open for another five, eight seconds here. We're up to about 70% voted. Um, we'll close it and share those results. All right, up to about 85%. So we're going to go ahead and close that, share the results. So we had 45% say that the landowner is responsible. About 5% say a local government entity like the city or county or someone is responsible. So if there's any city officials on here, they're, they're breathing, a, breathing a sigh of relief now that people aren't going to be coming to them for answers. 42% uh, all of the above and 8% none of the above. So um, the answer is... Um, you usually so there are some caveats to this um generally speaking if there's a stream erosion issue or debris issue on your property and you want it taken care of you are the one who's responsible for taking care of that now there are some exceptions if um you are somewhere in a community and um for some reason uh, the city or the county or some other entity has a maintenance easement um, on the stream channel. This is not common, but um, you may, um, they may be responsible for that. Also, uh, typically um, local government agencies are going to be clearing debris at bridges and things, the, the bridges, other road crossings at public roads. And if that kind of neighbor boarding on your property, clean up that um, if it's impacting it as well. Oftentimes, um, the other issue, times would be um, sometimes a local sewer district. Uh, for instance, if you're in the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District Service Area, um, they have taken on a lot of uh, stream management issues. It doesn't mean if there's an issue, they're going to address it. They'll come out and look at it and rank it and add it, see where it rank comes out in their priority system, and they may or may not address it. But that's more than you get um, in most areas. Um, so you generally, it's the landowner who's responsible. Um, now, do you have to clear debris or address erosion problems? Um, no. <laughs> Basically, if you got a debris jam down there and it's not bothering you, even if it's like impacting upstream neighbor, um, now it might be neighborly to do something like that, but um, you are not required uh, to remove that debris or fix that erosion problem. Um, there are exceptions. Uh, there are some communities that have ordinances that state that a uh, stream owner is required to keep the stream uh, uh, clear
clear and free flowing or things like that where they could make you come in and clean that out or I guess eventually clean it out and bill you for it. Um, I'm aware of one or two communities um, that have that and I've never ever known them to enforce it. Um, I just don't know if it's be a political um, issue or um, they still have never had a situation where it's severe enough where they need to. Yeah, so I, that's that unless. Um, so um, that kind of wraps up the kind of looking at those rights and responsibilities of streamside landowners, um, some of those legal issues. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Also, I uh, just want to point out, um, I think I mentioned this earlier, but in the handouts section, um, two of the um, handouts there relate to uh, Ohio drainage law and some of these rights and responsibilities. The Who Owns Ohio Streams, um, it's put out by Ohio Department of, Part, Department of Natural Resources. And there's another like an overview of Ohio drainage laws there. So um, if you really want to get a little more uh, detail or into the weeds on some of those, um, they do a good job of explaining uh, those issues. Uh, the final two downloads there are more related to um, our, what we're going to talk about now, which are common stream problems and solutions. So uh, just make sure um, that you, if you weren't aware that you check out those handouts, I believe you can download those uh, direct from the uh, GoToWebinar interface here. So, all right. So um, again, so the three main stream problems and solutions that we're going to look at are stream bank erosion, um, uh, debris and log jams, and flooding. Those are the ones we typically, uh, so the Cuyahoga Soil and Water Conservation District, um, part of what we do is we do a lot of landowner assistance visits where somebody has having issues with stream issues or drainage or any other natural resource issue, and we'll go out and do a site visit. Um, and these are the kind of, as far as stream related issues, these are the big ones, stream bank erosion being the largest uh, issue that we get called out to kind of help people address. Um, other soil and water conservation districts, Chicago Watershed Partners, watershed groups also provide these kind of services. So if you're looking for that one-on-one -on -one help, uh, don't hesitate to contact someone at your local soil and water conservation district or watershed organization. So um, this stream is kind of a diagram showing an unhealthy stream. Um, if you have a stream on your property, maybe it looks like this. Uh, things that make it unhealthy, the lawn is mowed up to the edge, that those turf roots of that turf grass are really shallow. You're not going to get um, a lot of protection from that. And as soon as it roads down, you're going to be below the depth of them anyway. Um, it really uh, uh, is not good. Uh, once you get start, stream bank erosion starts, it'll really go quickly in these kind of situations. Um, yard waste dumped by the stream, you might say, well, what's the big deal there? It's not in the stream channel. Obviously, you don't want it in the stream channel either because as it breaks down, um, it sucks oxygen out of the water. Um, it can clog downstream culverts, things like that. But um, on the banks even, um, it'll kill smother vegetation. Um, and so you'll kill the vegetation that's there providing roughness and the roots that are there anchoring our soil. Um, you'll smother those out and you won't really have um, You'll lose that protection as well. You can see the banks sloughing in, pieces, chunks falling in. Um, there's some hard armoring. We usually try to avoid hard armoring and maybe use it as a last resort. Or in certain situations where we'd recommend like the gaping baskets, so the baskets filled with rocks, but not usually. Those typically aren't good for streams um, and they typically aren't as permanent um, of a solution as people tend to think they might be. Uh, so here's some just illustrations of stream bank um, erosion. Uh, these are all in Cuyahoga County. Um, and you can see from the super severe up there in the top left uh, corner, um, you see it's not a very large stream channel right there, um, at least not when it's not raining, um, but it definitely has experiencing severe erosion, down cutting that's very much disconnected from its floodplain. You're starting to launch trees into the stream channel. Uh, the upper right is another illustration of just turf grass stream through a yard. And once it starts down cutting, it really just starts unraveling. You've got clumps falling down into the stream channel. 
Um, and then finally on the bottom, um, you can see, again, just more typical erosion. It's a pretty small stream channel at this point. Um, we get a lot of these where we come out and take a look at them and people will say, well, when I bought this house 15 years ago, I could just hop across um, and kids go down and play with it. And now there's no way they can even get in there. Uh, got the Grand Canyon, things like that. And that's how fast some of these things can happen. And it's important too, if you start to have erosion, you know, that's the best time to try to address it. Uh, waiting until you have a problem so severe like the one in the upper left-hand picture, and it gets really expensive if it's even possible to, to address, uh, start to be a multi-property solutions and things like that, not just doing something your own property. Uh, but you can see the drainage pipe here in the bottom picture um, jutting out pretty far um, or where the stream has eroded back. Um, typically when those are installed, sometimes, but they're usually not sticking out more than um, a foot or so. Um, so some of the solutions, um, it's like I've talked about it before too, but just maintaining that vegetated buffer along your stream channel. Um, if you have it, leave it. If you don't have it, work on making it. Um, Streamside, forested streamside buffers are one of the most important things that we can do um, for protecting the health of our streams, reducing erosion. They, I mean, they have all sorts of benefits. They shade the stream so the water temperature is cooler, so they hold more oxygen. Uh, the limbs and stuff, so they fall in, provide habitat, help slow the flow of water down, can actually help catch sediment um, behind them and build up the stream bed if it's eroded down. Uh, most people see the debris, the like woody debris in the stream channels, and they think we got to take this out. It's really one of the best things we can have in our stream channels. Um, and there, there are instances where that needs to be removed, and we'll talk about that, but uh, it is a really important piece to a healthy stream channel in Northeast Ohio. And of course, the roots help to hold, uh, anchor the soil in place. So um, when you're thinking about leaving a vegetated buffer, reestablishing a vegetated buffer, you know, a lot of times people say like, well, I don't want to give up my whole yard. And you basically, you Take what you can, but we really, you know, along the bank, so a sloped area here, this would be a great place to vegetate that. Even as much, so much as just stop mowing and let it naturally uh, kind of recolonize with things. Add some trees or some live stakes when you get a chance. Um, you can make it pretty. You see the flowers in these pictures, like the different zones of healthy stream corridor. Um, even smaller stream channels, like it's really important. You can have wildflowers there if you're really getting ambitious and you just want don't want it to be your grass growing up or um, while your trees are establishing. You can have native wildflowers, these tall grasses, um, will get very deep root systems as well, five, six feet, um, sometimes even deeper than trees, um, and can be uh, really important for holding uh, stream banks in place as well. Um, don't dump. We mentioned this. Um, you don't want to. Uh, dump your grass clippings over the stream channel. You can see on this side, this has been going on for a while, dumping leaves, grass clippings, and oh look, there's no vegetation there. Whereas on the other side, there's at least some sparse vegetation. Um, it'll kill, A, it'll end up in the stream channel, and that's not great. Um, and B, um, it will kill the vegetation that you're dumping it on and covering up, and then you'll lose that benefit. Um, so, one th another thing we can do, and you heard um, Eric mention live stakes, um, bioengineering, and this is just fancy word we say we're using for basically engineering with living materials. So um, instead of hard armoring a stream, concrete, things like that, um, using these living materials. So live stakes, and um, this is an illustration of that, um, where you plant them. Basically, you get, when you get it, it looks like a stick. One end is pointy and one end isn't. Um, and the ones we get uh, for distribution uh, to people are two feet long. You want to put it in at about a 90 degree angle to the bank. If your bank is straight up and down, you don't, you, can, you want to stick it up a little bit out of that. And you want it at least halfway um, to ideally two thirds the length of the stake in the soil, in the bank um, where you can. Now we're installing these. Um, sometimes you got nice soft bank material and you can just push it right in there and that's great. Um, other times um, you often will use uh, rebar uh, basically and a two pound, five pound uh, 
mini sledgehammer or something or a hammer uh, to make a pilot hole for it uh, to get it in there. If there's a lot of rocks or things like that, um, you'll often have to do that. Um, the other important thing to note, and uh, mentioned Eric say, you know, we're getting these in mid-December. We're talking about like December 18th for a pickup date potentially. Uh, you'll get that information. Um, and people say, well, that's not really late. Um, it's not like we want to plant these while they're dormant. So really the time for planting these is November through the end of March, beginning of April, depending on the year into May. Um, we did some last year and it was later in April and they're starting to almost not be dormant anymore. So anytime when they're dormant, and this also helps them, us, we can store them a little longer before installing them um, if you have to. Um, if you are getting live stakes, uh, you do want to keep them uh, moist um, and cool until you plant them. So here's some pictures of live stakes in action. Uh, these are actually on the Chagrin River. Um, you can see these, uh, the ones on the left, look like those are mostly willows. Uh, we get a variety of different species, willows, silky dogwood, red osier dogwood, pussy willow, uh, nanny berry, all sorts of different things. Um, and uh, certain ones, uh, when we distribute them, um, we'll let you know, but there's certain ones that grow better in the shade, other ones that grow better in the sun, and just depending on your situation, we'll try to hook you up with the, the ones that would be, do best for you. Usually try to get people mixed just to see what it'll take um, in that area. Um, you can see um, in the right picture here, it's those same ones a little later and they're a little bit flooded, but they look all the leafed out, branching out already. Um, so they provide roughness. We talked about roughness earlier um, along the stream bank, especially as they grow up more um, to help slow down the water so you don't have the water moving as quickly along the stream bank. And remember, moving water equals energy equals erosion. Um, but also the roots, it roots from this cutting, basically. These are species that root from these live stakes um, and they'll pretty aggressively root and establish those roots and help anchor the stream bank. Um, another uh, bioengineering solution is live machines. It's the same species and they're little longer pieces basically bound together in these bundles that you can see and they be installed um, along the stream bed. A lot of times we'll put these right at the interface between the, the water level and where the stream bank starts uh, and then step them up and go up another couple feet and put another row in there, things like that. Um, it's a little more work to install them. You got to dig the trench out and everything and anchor them. Um, but uh, in certain situations, uh, they can be really um, effective. Finally, brush mattresses. Or here we have live stakes and live machines in the same installation. On the stream, on the picture on the left, um, you see some of the live stakes sticking up right at the edge of the water. Those are actually holding live machines in place. Um, and then there's some matting there to hold some other uh, uh, materials down and then the live stakes installed on top of that matting. We had some seed and things underneath that in that installation. Um, the spacing on these, you want to have them a couple feet apart. Uh, the live stakes, as you can see when you're installing them, um, a lot of times when you're installing the stream bank, the spacing is going to determine by where there's not a rock or something like that where you can fit into. It doesn't have to be exact. I mean, it's going to mimic nature. Not all of them will survive. Uh, so you're just going to kind of get them in where you can. Often we'll do uh, two to three rows along a stream bank, depending on how uh, tall the stream bank is. Here you see brush mattresses. These are, again, the same materials, um, longer pieces laid on the stream bed. The stream bed's been not tilled, but raked pretty good to kind of loosen up the soil. Uh, these are put on there, you have to cover up with some of the soil then, uh, tied down with twine on the stakes. And again, uh, the point that they need to stay, have the bottom end of that in the water. So they're taking on the water and getting that water. Um, and then these will also then root from, as long as it stays in the soil, in contact with the soil um, and wet enough, they'll root from the branches down into the soil too and help hold that bank in place. Oops. Um, we don't see this as much. This is definitely not as easy to install as typically a homeowner kind of practice uh, just on your own, but um, on some of the other larger projects, a lot of times we'll do this if we get in a situation where we have to do some bank grading, which we'll talk about here shortly. Um, so um, 
a lot of times we have these stream banks and they're vertical or even more than vertical. It's like they're overhanging. In that case, yeah, you can do live stakes along the bottom. It's not going to completely solve the problem necessarily. A better solution, if you have space to do it, is to actually grade the bank back. And this is even a larger, this is a small project by a lot of our stream restoration standards, but it's still uh, larger than what a lot of times you do as a homeowner. But basically, you're excavating that bank, grade, grading it back to a more gentle slope, and then hopefully also providing this bankful bench. So a little floodplain down in the kind of next to the stream channel just to give it a little space to spread out. Um, you would also then, we followed this up with planting of trees, shrubs, things like that along the stream bank, um, along the floodplain there. Um, and again, this just gives it stream a chance to access the floodplain and those benefits. Even if it's just this flood bankful bench that's this the width or not even the full width of the stream channel, um, you'll get some of those benefits, at least immediately on this property, you're not going to uh, have that erosion. Um, you'll be able to get that flood water, those higher flows will go up onto the bankful bench and you'll have those functions of the floodplain. So debris and log jams, um, picture there a pretty severe one. Uh, consequences, you get the loss of conveyance could lead to upstream stream flooding. Uh, it could cause the diversion around the, the stream could try to erode around the blockage um, and that could cut into threatened infrastructure, your home, driveway, um, sewer lines, anything like that. Um, it could be caused by, like I said, any th kind of things. We see this a lot of times at culverts or bridges, wherever the flow becomes constricted, um, it tends to accumulate this kind of debris, um, but it can really anywhere, like down tree can start to accumulate other branches, things like that. Um, just to point out that people think like, okay, I got all this debris in here, I need to go and dredge it out so I keep it that whole free-flowing mentality. And that's almost never the answer. It really just, uh, makes the stream less stable it tends to get people tend to want to straighten it when they do that um and um streams around here don't want to be straightened so you just get more erosion just always be fighting it it's a temporary solution at best um that goes back to that, like it's mentality going back to like having uh agricultural ditches where you're draining water and in case you collect the sediment um this is not our streams are not agricultural ditches uh or we don't want them to be so um, you want to expect it. So uh, if when you would want to remove it would be basically when it's threatening infrastructure. Um, you see kind of different illustrations of different amounts of blockage here. Um, again, it's only a problem if they're threatening infrastructure. Otherwise, in most of our stream channels that are in size, down cutting and eroding, these are actually going to help build up the stream bed and reconnect the stream channel to the stream bank. I've actually done projects where we add woody debris to the stream channel to try to restore the stream. Um, so in most cases, you want to leave it, like I said, unless it's doing something that threatens, causes it to threaten infrastructure. So um, an illustration of this, this stream is flowing from the bottom left of the picture to the upper right. Um, and just, you can see downstream. So as you move, uh, looking flow from, towards the upper right of the picture, you can see the exposed stream bank there. So this is a stream channel, um, basically as it was before it was impacted by this debris jam, and it's definitely down cut and eroding the stream bank. You can see it a little bit here on the upstream. You can see it's starting to collect sediment upstream of this, and it's got a better connection to the floodplain because it's raised the gradient of the stream channel. So this flood, this debris jam um, in the woods is, helping restore the stream channel. It's helping reconnect to this floodplain. It's actually being very beneficial. Um, what you can't tell in this picture is the stream is actually starting to erode around this to the right. And about 10 feet to right of where this picture ends, there's a parking lot for a condominium complex. So this is one where I actually did advise them to remove the stream channel despite all these benefits because it was in a position where it's going to start eroding um, into an effect impacting infrastructure. Um, so it just depends on the setting, where it is, and what kind of potential uh, impacts it's having. If you are going to get in and do some uh, structure removal, I'm not gonna get into all this, but like if you're digging stuff out of the stream channel, you definitely want to, um, where you can use a long reach 
excavator. Um, you want to scoop in from the side. You do not want to have track vehicles in the stream channel to remove stuff whenever possible. You don't want a bulldozer you're scooping in there. Um, you want to not leave sediment you dig out there right in the floodplain where it's going to fill in the floodplain or make a levee. Um, use erosion control practices. Um, again, um, don't cut out live vegetation if you're removing uh, like woody debris, just the dead stuff that's stuck there in the stream channel, not the living stuff next to the stream. All right, and finally flooding. So this is, uh, if you're unfamiliar, this is um, a picture I took probably 10 years ago now. This is Abram Creek um, on Sheldon Road, right on the border between Middleburg Heights and Brook Park. Um, and it floods here all the time. <laughs> and uh, part of the issue with this is this bridge that goes over the stream channel is just really low. You can see the slope coming out of there. It's kind of in a valley. It's kind of designed almost to flood. Um, also, there's a uh, very constricted channel due to a railroad crossing downstream of this. Um, and upstream, there's Lake Abram, which is a giant uh, lake wetland that just absorbs that water and water raises up. So, um, well, I'm gonna go back and see. So uh, flooding issues are the hardest ones for us to solve unless it's being caused by some sort of culvert backup, debris jam at a bridge, things like that that are causing water to back up upstream. Um, if it's just, a lot of the flooding issues, unfortunately we deal with now are just products of you know, what we talked about earlier with the developed landscape and changing precipitation patterns. Um, it's not something that we're going to, you can solve. If you have flooding on your property, nine times out of 10, nine times out of 99 times out of 100, there's not something you can do on your property other than like moving structures um, or infrastructure um, to alleviate that flooding. Now, it doesn't mean that there's not things that can't be done. It's usually done at the community level, um, sewer district, soil and water conservation district, watershed groups going in and uh, doing projects to expand and reconnect floodplains upstream, um, go in and add stormwater storage um, in either old basins that where there's room to do that um, or um, in places where we're treating impervious surfaces that never were treated before, retrofitting these stormwater treatment um, uh, basins and other practices into the landscape but it's a big, expensive, long-term solution. So if you have flooding on your property, like I said, most of the time there's not a lot you can individually do if it's not being caused by a blockage or something like that. So uh, this is just something I found on the internet uh, several years ago. I just thought it was a very um, good summary for what we talked about today. So um, basically most rivers um, in Northeast Ohio want to look are sinuous, develop sinuous channels, look like an S. Um, a lot of times it says to, to often around here, we straighten channels or move channels to accommodate development so we can have fit that one more lot into the development um, or things like that. Um, and so they've been straightened, um, especially headwater streams. People tend to think, ah, it's just a little stream, it won't matter. Um, and then, that increases its slope, which remember slope increases its energy, um, and energy flowing water, energy and flowing water equals erosion. Um, and so the single factor that's led to successful operation of straightened channels has been combined the good points, both the sinuous and S shape and the straightened channels, which leads to the combined symbol representing the only successful means of maintaining straight channels. So if you have a straight channel or channel's been straightened, it's going through car constant maintenance, um, which means constant money. So I just thought that was a neat uh, visualization of all that. So um, thank you. Um, I'm sure we have some questions. I'd be happy to take some questions um, about this. And also, if you did sign up for the live stakes, you'll be getting more information by email about how you can get those and additional uh, planting instructions on this. So Eric, you have some questions? Or yeah, Jared, thank you for that. Um, we do have a few. Um, 
What if we don't have a proper stream but have areas of stagnant swampy land due to pre-existing man-made terrain as well as intermittent stream-like water flow? Um, what are something they could do? Do you think live stakes would help kind of absorb some of that moisture? Yeah, live stakes or even larger trees. Um, so, I mean, it depends on how much moisture it is as far as absorbing that. But a lot of times in those kind of situations, uh, different shrubs and trees, uh, we can, I'm sure, provide a list of some of those that are good in wet soils. But think button bush, sycamore, willows, they absorb a lot of that water and help pull up. You got to get a lot of that in there. There could be things, too, just from a drainage standpoint that you can look at. Uh, it sounds like there'd be kind of at a low spot, though, so I don't know. Here, kind of at the bottom of the um, bottom of the, the bowl, basically. Um, but the planting some of that vegetation can definitely help with that. And even uh, some of the we, prairie grasses, the kind of wildflower kind of things, those two are just a combination of all of that. Awesome. Well, I think that about wraps it up. Um, thank you very much, Jared, for taking the time to do this. Yeah. And thank you to all the viewers. Um, again, if you are interested in live stakes, we'll be getting those around mid-December. And Jared had mentioned we're targeting um, December 18th. So if you're interested, that is something we will get out to you. Um, we'll get you that information, make sure you know when and where to pick those up. Um, the session has been recorded, um, and if you would like to um, get a copy of any of these slides, I'm sure we could do that. You can email me or Kevin directly, um, and we should be able to get you any, any of that information. Um, we have one more, couple more questions here popping up. Okay. Um, what suggestions do you have when the, I think they're trying to say, uh, high tension power lines over the stream and the electric company keeps coming through and cutting down trees. And so typically uh, for um, in those situations, there is a certain height that above which you're, they are not, they cannot have, or their protocols dictate, you cannot have vegetation above a certain height. Um, I'd recommend shorter shrub kind of materials or even the, the prairie grass, things like that. A lot of the live stakes you plant, like down in the stream channel, they won't get as high as fast. Um, and you can actually, most of the live stake species, once they get, you know, four or five feet tall, you can actually cut the top off and they'll continue to sucker out the sides and you'll still get that benefit without it being as high. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Jared, and thank you everyone for attending. Um, if you have any more questions, feel free to reach out to me, Kevin, or Jared, yep. um, and we'll be happy to, happy to help you. Great. Thank you. Thank you.